Um, two things I remember about talking at UK NOF 34 is one, I wore a tie, and that seemed to provide a disproportionate amount of feedback on the IRC channel. So I thought I'd give you a, a waistcoat and see what happens. Uh, the other thing was I inadvertently upset a representative from BT at the time, who I understand I understand is not here, which is, uh, which is probably fortunate, because if he didn't like that presentation, he's going to hate this one. Uh, right, 25 years. It was complete 25 years ago. Now, it's easy to become slightly blasé about 25 years going by. It's... It's slightly longer ago in IT terms than we care to remember. Certainly, a Clinton had just been elected president of the United States, uh, and a future uh, head or presenter of The Apprentice was just making a name for himself in business at the time. Uh, and finally, the, uh, 25 years ago, Britain's most successful female Olympian wasn't quite born yet, which makes us all feel very old. Uh, Cambridge University however, has been around for 800 years, so it's all a matter of context, I guess. Uh, the fibre optic network in Cambridge was proposed actually in March 1987. So why are we giving this slight kind of uh, 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 history talk here? Well, the interesting thing about March 1987 is it was quite a long time before the web existed. This man, Tim Berners-Lee, created it in 1991 in CERN. Um, Actually, looking back, and Tony Finch, a colleague of mine, dug this out, RFC 1020, you can see just about November 1987, we get allocated our first B-class range of addresses. So we're planning on building a fibre optic network before we've got IP addresses, which is unexpected. You can see us there, we get the 232nd B-class range of addresses. So why are we doing this? Well, it's Cambridge University, right? What Cambridge University does is research more than teach students. I'm going to take you back a little bit further uh, to 1823. Charles Babbage came up with a proposal for designing the difference engine, the first ever mechanical computer. He gets a grant from the government, starts work, and of course, like all good academics, gets bored and never finishes the project. Uh, kind of got that far, then went on to the analytical engine and difference engine too, never finished any of them. Uh, 1930s, Maurice Wilkes sets up the first computing lab, uh, uh, along with this gentleman there at the time, Alan Turing, who you'll all be familiar with. Um, they went and did some war stuff for a bit. And then Maurice Wilkes came back and invented EDSAC, the first fully programmable computer in the late 40s. Since then, Cambridge University research has come up with the first ever programming manual, uh, the mechanism to uh, encrypt passwords one way, so that's the base of all Kerberos authentication. Uh, and more recently, the likes of Acorn Computing, ARM processors, Raspberry Pis have all come out of the university. The network itself, well, the university built its first network in 1977. It was a, uh, a copper ring network, and by all accounts, it did 10 megasecond which is pretty impressive for 1977. It took more than a third of a century for my domestic connection to get quicker than that. Uh, and then in 1987, the document says, a proposal for optical fibre cabling across university and colleges combining mainframe with other computers and personal machines. This is building a fibre optic network to do two things. It's to connect to the mainframe, the, the big central computing system, and to... Uh, share information. Typically, it was the classics departments wanting to share books between themselves. Uh, the name Granter, or Cambridge is built on the River Cam, the Granter is a contributory river to the River Cam, uh, for which, if you've seen the terrible TV series Grantchester, it's got the same stem. It's set in a village just outside Cambridge. That's what Granter means. So I have a very blurred picture of the network, and I'm going to explain why it's blurred later. It took four years to build, 88 to 92, cost 3.9 million pounds. That's about 8 million pounds just shy of in today's money. And for that, we got 36 kilometers worth of ducting and tray work, which was installed in wine cellars, 2.2 kilometers of the stuff, green spaces and carriageway. All right, wine cellars. There's the uh, fiber optic cabling. It's in tray work. Now, Cambridge, medieval city, Small roads, cobbled streets, 
If you've got cellars, and the university college has got lots of cellars underground, it's cheaper to run a fibre optic cable. However, it's problematic for two reasons. One, you can't pull fibre. You have to manually take it in. So it's a very manual process attaching it to tray work. It's much quicker to lift a manhole, pull a rope, and then pull 100 metres at a time. The second problem is that it's in a wine cellar. Now... <laughs> Uh, there's 31 colleges at Cambridge. Uh, some of them have an extensive cellar collection. St John's College has 160,000 bottles of wine in its wine cellar, or should have 160,000 bottles of wine, because, and it's not something we like to talk about, there is a discrepancy between how many bottles of wine are in the cellar and how many bottles of wine should be in the cellar, and we account for that delta by the term wine leakage. Uh, <laughs> Wine leakage has gone on for more years than we care to admit to, um, but it means that everybody's now very sensitive about who can go down to the wine cellars. Uh, for us, that means we have to book in an advance and be accompanied down every time we want to go see the fibre optic cable. This, in fibre terms, is a pain in the arse. Uh, the second place, green spaces, soft dick. Cambridge has a lot of green spaces. The colleges have a lot of space. Uh, that's what the city centre looks like. It's much easier, cheaper, to dig up green space than it is to lift cobbles. In today's terms, a metre of green soft dig is £20 a metre, industry rate. If you want to lift road, carriageway, it's £80 a metre. If you've got cobbles, it's £120 a metre. So it's a sixth of the price. Uh, there are problems with soft dig, though. It's very easy to lay fibre optic cables, but it's also exactly where you would put a building. In fact, Cambridge is going through a large development process at the moment, and it has two big spaces, one northwest Cambridge, which is building an entire estate over our fibre optic network, and West Cambridge, where they're building a lot of new research labs. What does this mean? It means the enablement work for any building going up, the first start is us having to redirect the ducting, which is painful. Sometimes we've had to do that three or four occasions, a single piece of ducting. So it's laying new duct, pulling new fibre, and moving individual circuits across. Even in the city centre, where you've got courtyards that are hundreds of years old, redevelopment goes on. And when the redevelopment goes on, the first thing that has to move is the fibre optic cable. So it's not as easy a solution as it first looks. Now, the other trouble with green spaces is even if people aren't building there, they tend to put fence posts there with alarming accuracy. <laughs> Uh, there's one. Um, nobody ever tells you that they've pulled up your fibre optic cable. You have to guess when half your network goes dark, and then you have to get on a bike and look for what we refer to as the smoking JCB, or, or, or often a smoking fence post borer. Uh, there's another one. For some reason, I'm holding a bit of fibre there. For those of you not technical, that bit's broken. Um, Oh, yeah, and the other place we run it through is fields. There's some university fields. Now, agriculture should be safe, right? Uh, it's designated use. Uh, you put it deeper than the plough goes, it's great. Uh, you even have a way leave stipulating when you can access, because there isn't manholes. You have to literally dig down, break the duct, pull new fibre, and then uh, cover it over. The trouble is, is if you've got to pull more fibre in a hurry, uh, that means you end up four months into your new job negotiating buying some peas off a farmer for a £1,000. Um, it's not a way I saw my career going at the time. The really disappointing thing of it is I was expecting a £1,000 worth of peas to turn up at work, and you never see it, of course, because they're not ripe. That's why he's charging you. Uh, other places, standards. National Joint <coughs> Utilities Group have standards for... Uh, where to put your, your utilities. This is an example of uh, the diagram on the pavement. Telecoms, 350 millimetres deep. That's where you should put it, but we're Cambridge. We like to go a little bit further than everywhere else. So we put ours at 600 mil. That's gold-plated. There's a problem, though, because when somebody else wants to come and dig up the pavement, well, they can find out where the electricity and the gas uh, and the, uh, and the uh, water go, because they all show up on a, on a uh, K 
cat and jelly, an electrical survey. But fibre optics doesn't. But that's okay because they carefully uh, dig to about 300 mil and then start looking for telecoms. They don't find any. They carry on to about 450 mil deep, still don't find any, and get the JCB out again, which is unfortunate because then they find our fibre optic cable. Uh, we did that mistakenly in both the footway and the carriageway. We exceeded the standards. Or to put it another way, we didn't follow the standards. <laughs> right, what do we use it for? Well, we use it for all the things you would expect you would use it for these days. We use it for an internet, for a LAN, uh, for Wi-Fi, for our high-performance computing. We're putting a LoRa net network on it now. Um, and then building management systems, data center hosting, uh, Wi-Fi, we run fiber optics straight to the access points, college hostel, CCTV, very large use case. Our customers, well, we've got a fiber optic network. It's kind of a little bit like oil in the ground, so you might as well use it. So we use it, uh, the colleges use it, and now we start renting it, leasing it to the medical research councils, the other university, uh, cancer research, the council, bass, colleges, all sorts. So anybody that's roughly in our space in Cambridge. What's the cost of running your own private fibre network? So we're fully cost recovery. We don't get any money from the university. We lease every fibre we use, and it costs about 500,000 a year to run our own fibre optic network. That's 850 active circuits. Uh, 260 pounds per kilometre is what we charge our clients. So we've got about 2,000 kilometres of fibre in use. Pays for our staff, our equipment, maintenance of the network, extensions to the network, office overheads and promotion. Promotion. So we've got our fibre optic network. We want to promote it, but there's a problem. So you get a proper as-built map. You get very detailed maps of where you put your fibre optic network. And then mistakenly in the past, that's been circulated. And then undesirables try to steal the copper out of your fibre optic network, which is a very disappointing outcome for both parties involved. <laughs> so what you want to do is you want to show everybody where your fibre optic network goes, but you don't want to actually show them where it goes, uh, which is a problem. But there is a solution because we see it every day, certainly when you've come down to this conference. London Underground Map does a wonderful example of creating a map that shows you where it goes without the details. So we looked at that and we thought, we can do that. So we got out our marker pens and we had a go. And it turns out I'm not a great artist. Uh, but I thought that's freehand. If you give me a computer package, I'll be better. But I wasn't. Uh, so we got somebody who knew what they were doing involved. And we got that, which is our fiber optic network. So it's a, a very simple way, because everybody understands how a network works. You have to explain that the colors don't matter on a fiber optic network, but it doesn't matter. There you go. And this year we've got uh, 25 years of the GBN. So earlier this year, late May, early June, before the unpleasantness, we went to the European Commission because they were looking to write a paper on the uh, gigabit society. So this was a belief that domestic uh, requirements are going towards a gigabit. And what are the needs? What are the use cases out there? So this is me and the, the, the guy who runs the network on a full-time basis. We went over there. And subsequently in November, and this won't apply to us, uh, a white paper has been released from the European Commission on uh, standards to be met by 2025. That's so 95% of Europe will get a, or should have access to a gigabit connection by 2025. During that process, I got asked a question which was, what about vectoring? Now, vectoring, I'm sure you're probably all very familiar with this, is to do with GFAST, to do with the, the GFAST standard. Now, GFAST is a, a technology that incumbents of a lot of copper, so incumbents within various countries uh, use to extend the life of their copper. Effectively, you're running fibre to the cabinet and then using various frequencies to get a slightly faster rate through your copper, and that way you don't have to dig up the road and lay fiber. Um, that isn't my opinion. That's actually what they say on their website. This simplifies GFAST deployment for less fiber digging. 
Uh, they also say on their website, which is interesting, bearing the mind I was asked in reference to the Gigabit Society, they, they show this. First of all, you'll notice that it doesn't go up to a gigabit. Uh, and vectoring does get you a high rate, but as long as you're 50 metres from the cabinet, you almost have to be sitting on it. If you get out to 300 metres, it just tails away to almost an irrelevant rate. And if you're two kilometres away, then forget it. Now, generic internet consumption chart. We can discuss internet consumption till the cows come home. But if we presume time's fairly linear and data's going to go up, sooner or later, we are going to get to the gigabit. Now, it might be 2025. It might be before or after. But sooner or later, all of those lines cross the copper threshold, and then your only option is fibre. Uh, fibre to the premises, fibre to the building. There's the OECD. There's the UK. Uh, we're... 3% fibre to the building, compared to Spain, which is a basket case and over 60%. Uh, big data. Why do we think the line's going to keep on going up? Well, at Cambridge, we deal in big data. We get data from the Large Hadron Collider in CERN. Generates 25 petabytes of data a year, which is quite a lot. Uh, biggest science project in the world. The next biggest science project in the world starts in 2020, which is the Square Kilometre Array which generates an exabyte of data, so that's the next order of magnitude, a day. To explain how much data that is, we have a 40 gig internet connection at Cambridge, and if we were to do nothing else but download a day's worth of data from the square kilometre array, it would take six years and nine months. It's a staggering amount of data, and you're not going to do that over anything other than lots of fibre. Uh, but it also applies to the rest of us. Gene sequencing, year 2000, was uh, complete on the first human genome at the cost of £3 billion. Over Christmas, I got bought a present to sequence my genome for £75 to show me my ethnicity. This has been massively commercialised really quickly. Uh, AstraZeneca moving to Cambridge think that uh, sequence-based drugs are going to be the future, and that's going to require gene sequences that generate a terabyte of data every six hours to be deployed at your local supermarket. Uh, that's the building they're putting up, and we're putting in our own fibre connection to them, because it's the only way we can share reasonable amounts of data at a reasonable speed. So what lessons have we learned? What are the lessons of running your own fibre optic network? Standards. Just follow the standards. There's no shortcuts. There's no doing it cheaply. Just follow the standards. Data demand is growing. We can argue about how much, but we see it constantly at the university. It's only heading in one direction. Demand for fibre, demand for data is just going north. Fibre is the only solution. It's the only long-term solution. Now, the interesting thing about copper is if I owned, and I don't want to be a hypocrite about this, because if I owned a lot of copper, I would be doing everything I can to sweat the value out of it. But it's still not a long-term solution. It doesn't get us to where we want to be. Fibre's really cheap. Now, people tell you that digging up the road's expensive. It's not expensive because we do this. We get a return on investment on digging up the road in three to five years. It's not expensive. As long as your time horizon isn't 18 months, it's cheap. And private fibre is easy. Laying your own fibre optic network and maintaining it is really easy. And if you don't believe me, these two guys can do it, and that's basically a poor man's version of Right Said Fred. <laughs> uh, we're not the only people to do it. In Manchester, I was very impressed by uh, this group, Barn, who did a um, presentation on laying their own fibre optic network, and all credit to them. But the point is, and it's my last point on this presentation, they and we shouldn't be doing this. I'll take you back to the early slides. Cambridge University is a research university. We built a research fibre optic network. We designed computers, but we don't make computers anymore. It gets commoditised by the industry, and then we just consume them in the same way that we consume electricity or water. We should be getting fibre connectivity from the industry at a cheaper rate than we're doing it, because we're not a very large scale. Um, and if you don't believe me, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport in December sent out a call for evidence because it's 
suggested, I didn't suggest, explicitly stated that fibre optic deployment is not going at the rate it needs to in this country to meet future demand. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Brian has been again, very informative and, and, and excellent talk. Um, do you not find that there's a benefit given the the geographic area you're working in is is, is very localized, uh, that there's a benefit to you owning, maintaining, and having access to your own fiber network? So we consume a lot of fiber. We uh, spin up circuits for research projects and we close them down and we pass on the cost for splicing to the research departments. But I think you could, could have made that argument about electricity or water consumption. It's just a utility. There's nothing, I'm not doing anything special with fibre. It's not scientific grade fibre. It's just fibre. And if a, a utilities provider can provide it between building A and building B on the time frame that I'm currently delivering, at the same cost point or lower, then I don't see why I would be doing it myself. Okay, um, Rob. Uh, this is a question from Paul Mansfield in uh, the chat room. As a small business in Cambridge, can I pay Cambridge University to deploy fibre instead of going to an incumbent carrier? Right, so this is certainly something that's crossed our minds. Um, part of the call for evidence that's going out to the Department for CMS, uh, we are asking for clarity on state aid. Now, Cambridge University typically uh, actually gets more than 50% of its income not from the state. So it's not bound, but it tends to follow... Uh, public body guidelines. Uh, competing against state aid when you've got fibre is really difficult because BT Openreach, as ruled by Ofcom in November, don't lease dark fibre at all. I'm trying to sell my or lease my product against a market price that doesn't exist and I don't know how to do that. And I'm hoping that the legislation will change to enable me to do that. So, yes, yes. I mean, ideally, I might as well... You know, it's, I've got oil in the ground, I might as well use it. I'd like to do that. Okay, um, Dave. Hi, um, Dave from WarwickNet. Um, BT now have a product called PIA, where you can put an inch diameter subduct down BT's ducts, and it'll go from whatever building you like to whatever building you like and then you stick your own fibre in it. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of that on business parks between our various cabinets. Would that have satisfied your use case? Would that have been a solution to why are we digging ducts? Or would that not have covered what you're doing? Uh, in an ideal scenario, that would be great. But let me give you an example of the data centre. So we built a £20 million data centre two years ago, and we ran in a diverse uh, GBN, grant to backbone network, ducting to that. And we also wanted other telcos to run in so we could have interconnects. Uh, we waited nine months because it was a new building, so there were no ducting. We had nine months of communication with BT. And in the end, we had to go get one of their engineers and show them where to dig the hole. Um, it sounds like a lovely scenario that I can just go work with them. But they're not engaging in this process at all. We have to drag them out there. Let, let me phrase it slightly differently. If that process worked... Would it have satisfied your requirement? Yeah, because I just want to consume fibre. I just want to consume fibre really cheaply. Okay. Uh, ben Roder, Soho Net. Um, I was curious about how you deal with fibre rating. How do you mean fibre rating? Uh, the rates that you pay on lighting fibre? Uh, so uh, most of our fibre we lease is dark fibre. 
So we get uh, research departments, we splice them a piece of fibre from whichever building to whichever building on campus, uh, typically eight kilometres, but sometimes 10, 12 in length, and then they light it themselves. We run our own, on top of that, another part of my job is to provide the IP network for the university, and then we light that in a traditional way. But uh, most of the fibre we provide is dark fibre. So how do the researchers then pay for the rates that they're then liable for? Oh, so, so, uh, so there are no rates. It's a private network. It's just an internal... It's like, a, it's, like a, it's like me leasing a bit of copper within a building. It's just an internal transaction between two departments. There's no VAT, there's no rates. You can, you, you, you can internally trade as much as you like within a large organisation, and Cambridge is a good example of it. A rateable value. Only, only if you're a licensed ISP. O only, only if you're doing it externally. Otherwise, you're just recouping internal recharge. Okay. Any last questions for John? I think we've got one more there. Can I ask what your thoughts are on using uh, fibre as a core network and a backbone, but, but where lower capacity, say up to only 10 gig, is needed using wireless ultra-low latency for the last mile? It depends on the environment. So, so we have, we have fibre, copper, wireless. Um, if it's a long-term investment, if it's... And, you know, Cambridge has been around 800 years, so we're confident we're going to be here for another 800 years, or at least another 100. And then passive is, tends to be cheaper than active if you're deprecating it over a long enough period of time because you keep on having to replace the active equipment and uh, manicure it. Um, however, if it's for a temporary, we do, use, we do use wireless in some scenarios. So, you know, where there's a particular event that requires a, a local area network then we'll spin up wireless for it and close it down. But generally, long term, passive is cheaper. Okay, thank you very much, John. Thank you.